Now, as the final journey of Queen Elizabeth II continues and the United Kingdom bids farewell, the country and the world at large also prepare for what the transition to a new King Charles III reign means going forward. Well, here in Kenya, a former colony and a current member of the Commonwealth, what effect will the changes have? Well, joining us in studio now is a foreign affairs analyst, John Gache. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, you know, Kenya is a very special place to the royal family. Of course, this is where Queen Elizabeth II found out that she would be ascending to the throne. Um, and Kenya at the time was still in the colonial era at that time. We went through independence and, you know, from then on, the Commonwealth. But what legacy would you say the Queen had here, specifically to Kenya, through all those years? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Victoria. I would say that the, the Queen has, I would say, a mixed legacy in Kenya. Mm. There are those that feel fairly strongly that regardless and since her long reign, she's never really come round to formally even expressing a bit of reservations or re regret about the British colonial rule and its excesses, and in particular uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and also during the Mau Mau, and that for all those years that she's been around and she's been hailed and indeed has been a force for the Commonwealth, she hasn't really been able to, as a sovereign, to acknowledge that what Britain did in its prime uh, was really, to put it very mildly, crimes against humanity. Mm. Having said that, she's also perhaps tried uh, over the last 70 years to moderate, so to speak, soften the blue, so to speak, about the British colonial empire coming to an end, or rather, sun setting on it. If you remember, there was this saying a long time ago, there's the, the sun never sets in the British empire. <laughs> but indeed, it did set. However, the Queen and indeed the British government through the Commonwealth tried to look for what I would call a soft landing, so to speak, yep. in a way that the, the empire did come to an end but perhaps they still have some residual uh, nostalgic hole, so to speak. Having said that, the Queen as a person was a fairly um, very um, you know, important person, has her personality, but perhaps what she did represent, the British monarch and its excesses right across the world in India, mm. in Papua New Guinea, in Kenya, in Nigeria for that matter, and, in, and indeed, perhaps the biggest blot on the Queen really was her perhaps failure to be very vigorous against the apartheid system in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, what we had in Rhodesia, then so currently Zimbabwe. Right. But I think she managed to kind of adapt and create the Commonwealth, or rather, she was a face and the force behind it. Yeah. But I think it's in that situation, I think she, uh, she would be, she'll be having mixed uh, results indeed. But as a person, she was a fairly <coughs> a polite and very you know, interesting personality. Yeah. John, yeah. I was speaking to my mother today and she's of that generation. Yeah generation that was either incarcerated, detained, put in concentration camps, and there's that bittersweet feeling. Yeah. What should they do? I mean, is it time to forgive, let bygones be bygones? Because some of them still feel the hurt. I, I think it's a catch both ways, Jeff, here. I think the British government, and indeed the entire British people, have for a long, long, long time intended to kind of forget, forgive and forget. You cannot do that. I think it, it, it's, it's very important that you express sorrow and you express, uh, you know, uh, um, what shall I say, um, sorrow and perhaps even ask for a bit of forgiveness. Mm. And indeed, right across the world, in terms of retribution, in terms of reparations, in terms of all this, there is a question of acknowledgement. Mm. And one of the things that the British government, and indeed the British system, has persistently refused to do is to acknowledge its role. And I think when you say your mother, my mother, 
feels equally very strong. And I think a lot of, as perhaps one of the uh, best uh, known cultural uh, um, uh, exponent in this country, Dr. Nyairo said, we really must be very careful that we must acknowledge that she did a good job, but she left a lot of things that ought to have been put on the table to acknowledge at least. So perhaps your mother and my mother and a lot of other people's mm -hmm. mothers here would be able to feel that at least they do acknowledge that there were excesses, regardless. And that we would be able to, as somebody said, forgive and forget, but you cannot ignore. And I think the British government has persistently, right across, despite the Commonwealth, despite all this, tried very much to kind of, um, shall I say, sweep it under the carpet, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I think it's, it's about time then, with a new uh, monarch coming in, perhaps, and perhaps Jeff and perhaps uh, uh, Victoria, yeah. that the British government will be able to say, we did cross the line, so to speak. And we are sorry for that. And perhaps then you and my mother and our grandparents and a lot of other people right across the world will be able to say, uh, perhaps they did acknowledge there were excesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see if that actually happens under the reign of King Charles III. But, um, you know, when you look at the Commonwealth, how it was formed to be this family of member states, um, it has kept its soft international influence over the years. And many people credit that to the Queen, this, this deference to her because of who she was. She's now no longer. Mm. King Charles III takes over. Do you feel the British Empire still has that influence or it's waning now that she has left the scene? I, I, I think the jury is still out, but perhaps if the British Empire is waning, perhaps it's collapsing slowly. Mm. But perhaps by a, a different play of words, the Commonwealth then becomes what we call a soft landing of the British Empire. Because if you were to look at the, the Commonwealth as it is, from uh, the, what I would call the, um, the white Commonwealth, all right, from the extreme New Zealand, all right, and Canada, that's, that's fairly much more of a white man's uh, Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that, and they are still dominions. But then you have to look at the other key players in the Commonwealth, and one is India. The other one is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. The other one is South Africa. Yeah. And of course, Kenya. And indeed, what are our relationships, so to speak? And I think the Commonwealth did provide the British government and the British people a soft landing, for lack of a better yeah. term. Has the Commonwealth really helped the countries? I would say the jury is still out. Mm. But then what is common? Is it that we had some British uh, colonial experience? Or is it that we did adapt some British uh, mannerisms, the English, the language I'm speaking, and perhaps uh, the, the bureaucracy and the legal processes? Is that Commonwealth? Now, uh, if you look at the Commonwealth in itself, it's about over 54, 56 countries. And indeed, as currently as we stand, there are countries like, one, Australia, Canada, Belize, and possibly a few others within uh, the small islands, St. Kevin's and Kiet, uh, oh, Jamaica, and what have you, have indicated that they would be able not to be dominion, so to speak, right. and that for after the, the queen had, has gone, they will be republican, and then possibly, then there will be a change. Has the Commonwealth delivered? In particular, yes, it did to an extent. And the best example for me was when it really, um, shall I say, led in the negotiation of then Rhodesia to what is Zimbabwe. And Kenya played a role in sending his you know, troops in the Commonwealth you know, place and what have you. And every four years, we have this huge show, the Commonwealth Games, and then we have every four years, again, we have the Chogam, what we call it, the, the Commonwealth uh, you know, head of state meeting, you know, and what have you. But again, the Commonwealth is also expanding. If you remember that we've had Rwanda, Just Mozambique, yeah. and Gabon have joined. Those are non, you know, uh, non-English speaking, so to speak. But also the Commonwealth did lose, as it were, possibly other countries. That's talking about Sudan. Mm. 
Mm. You're talking about Saudi Arabia. You're talking about uh, a lot of the, 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 shall I say, the Islamic countries. They didn't join. Why? I think there's, there are a lot of issues there. Is the Commonwealth relevant? Yes, it is. But perhaps, the, is the Commonwealth, will the Commonwealth be any more different? I think so. Will King Charles III be able to rally the Commonwealth as her mother did? I doubt it. Because I think she was fairly, uh, she was fairly well endowed in terms of diplomacy, and she was a fairly uh, articulate and very, you know, uh, soft winning. So in that regard, yes, will King Charles manage that? I don't know, but the jury's out. John, real quick before we let you go, the one thing Queen Elizabeth II will be remembered most for. One thing, real quick. The Commonwealth. The Commonwealth. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, there's been uh, worries about the Commonwealth being a lot more common in terms of language and culture, but the wealth not so much translating to some of the member states. So let's it's see if that down. is different exactly yeah. for the, the common and wealth. Common, common and wealth. wealth. There you go. Thank you. John Garcia, Foreign Affairs Thank Analyst. You. Thanks so much. Good to see you as always. Welcome. All right, we're going to take a break right here on Sunday Live and come back. Plenty more stories ahead. Stay with us. Keep tweeting at Koinange Jeff. At Vicky Rubadiri. At Citizen TV Kenya. The hashtag is Sunday Live. Sunday Live takes a break. We'll be back in the meantime. Coming up.